thanks very much. You haven't even heard what I've had to say yet, so a round of applause is very positive. Uh, as Lisa said, my name's Stuart Murray, um, uh, and we're going to be talking about sport and diplomacy. Uh, one of the, the problems facing a, a diplomatic scholar and practitioner is the, the curious business of estrangement. Uh, people, nations and states are separate and we do remain alienated from one another. Uh, divisions are rampant in the 21st century. The world is brimming with all sorts of religious, national and ethnic conflicts. Politically, we live in a world of 192 states of varying degrees of power. Uh, all of these states are different. They have different uh, characters, flags, histories. Old states grow and fragment, and new states are born all the time, often amid uh, Hobbesian levels of violence, bloodshed, and heartache. 7.3 billion people are separated by borders and socially constructed myths and narratives uh, differentiating us from them. In this context, humans have created many different institutions to overcome and mediate this fundamental condition of alienations, uh, institutions that allow us to interact amicably, to tame with animals within us all. Sport and diplomacy are two of those ancient, venerable institutions that have great relevance for us today. The subject of sport is what brings us all together, and we're actually engaging in a bit of diplomacy for the moment. In part, I'm representing a body of scholars and practitioners that have been working in sport and diplomacy for the past five or six years. Through language itself, a device uh, we developed to overcome separation, we're engaging in some form of communication and negotiation. Uh, in other words, I'm jabbering away up here, and you're trying to figure out what I'm meaning. Uh, a situation compounded by my unusual Gaelic accent. And I could tell you a hundred stories of miscommunication, uh, even in Australia. Uh, in terms of sport, I've always had a long interest in it, and I, I just want to show you this, this quick, uh, quick little cut down the, the bottom here. Um, I'm not sure if, if everyone can, can see it, uh, or if it even works, thanks to Bond's uh, Institute of Technology. Okay. <laughs> This is a lecturer's curse. I think the machines are becoming more sentient and the, they sense my uh, apathy towards them. Um, but in terms of sport, this is actually a clip uh, of a game uh, between Rangers and Arbroath uh, from 1972 in Scotland. Uh, and my father played in that game. And it was a famous victory for Arbroath over one of the old firm teams uh, towards the end of his career. And I've spent a lot of time uh, traipsing all over the old country watching games of football. I've met legends on many occasions, uh, for example, Sir, a Sir Alex Ferguson, I've met him several times, and he's a magical uh, character. Uh, I was also lucky to spend time with a another man called John Charles, who was regarded as the gentleman footballer and one of the finest footballers in the, the 1950s and 60s. And this man was a paragon of what a, a sporting champion should be. And all the people from my father's generation knew there was something magical about sport. And part of the research that Caitlin and I are doing uh, seeks to tap into and unleash this magic uh, in both sport and diplomacy and, uh, and breed it in a fractured world. The first thought that usually springs to mind uh, when discussing any relationship between uh, sport and politics is the old cliche that sport and politics don't mix. Uh, this is nonsense and why the phrase is often regarded as a cliche. It's uh, something that's been overused to the point of losing its original meaning, to the point of being trite or irritating. Sport and politics mix all the time, and what's more, they've done so since time immemorial. Uh, with lots and lots of evidence to support this assumption, um, in the early uh, city-states such as Babylon, uh, Tyre, Jericho, Ur and Uruk, early politicians sought neat, palatable and cheap means of binding their populations together. And we've got lots of uh, interesting uh, and quite amusing evidence. Uh, hieroglyphs of ancient Egyptians wrestling, lifting weights, swimming, rowing, and engaging in athletics uh, and various kinds of ball games. Uh, speaking of ball games, the ball game in Mesoamerica dates back to 1400 BCE. It was an extremely violent mixture of uh, football and basketball. We have hurling in ancient Ireland, uh, Shinty in Scotland, that dates back uh, two and a half thousand years. Um, and the, the ancient Olympiad is one that people often associate with the, the history of sport and politics. Uh, this tournament began in 776 BC in a religious setting as one of the activities during the festival of Zeus, subsequently morphed into a sporting competition and was abolished in 394 AD.
by the Emperor Theodosius I as part of a campaign to abolish paganism and impose Christianity as a state religion. So in the old days, institutions like religion, diplomacy and sport were shared rituals aimed at overcoming estrangement between disparate people and separate political groups. As Archetti reminds us, uh, sport and diplomacy were vital to the development of social organisations to reduce open conflict among social groups and codes for social behaviour oriented towards the exercise of individual self-control." So from the outset, both sport and diplomacy were civil, civilising and civilised institutions. And we've lots of more recent examples. Uh, the Fields of Cloth of Gold Summit uh, uh, just produces amusing pictures in my mind as well. Uh, after a century of hostilities, uh, King Francois I of France and Henry VIII of England hosted a two-week summit in the Fields of Cloth of Gold in northern France. And for two weeks, the kings and the retinues wrestled, jousted and competed in archery events as a means of strengthening the bond of friendship between the two monarchs after the signing of the Anglo-French Treaty 1514. Uh, 20th century speaks for itself, um, more dark episodes of sport and politics mixing, and I need go no further past the fascist games in 1936 and 1938, the World Cup in 38, which was won by Mussolini's black shirts, incidentally. So as uh, the Australian scholar Graham Allison uh, reminds us, all kinds of states have endorsed sporting competition as a testing ground for the nation or, uh, or for a political system. Nazis, fascists, uh, communists, Maoists, Democrats and Juntas all have played the game and believed in it. So when we're, we start to think about uh, writing about sport and politics, considering the longevity I mentioned, its utility and prominence, sport has generated a lot of work. And you can see three seminal examples behind me there, uh, works by Chatway and Goodart. Uh, Blanchard and uh, Grant Jarvie, who incidentally is my boss at Edinburgh University where I, I work as well. Uh, and there are many other articles and books that relate to sport for peace, sport for development and sport as a tool for conflict resolution. So sport has been theorised on by philosophers, biologists, lawyers, human security specialists, peace studies scholars, authors such as George Orwell, uh, who famously wrote that sport was simply war minus the shooting. But far less attention has been paid to the means of those exchanges, uh, which is sports diplomacy. The conscious use of sport, sports people and mega events to realise diplomatic and foreign policy objectives through the soft power of attraction. So there are a couple of things to mention uh, about the study of sport and diplomacy. It's important to mention that the concept is relatively new. For decades, uh, sport and diplomacy languished in the bleachers of uh, the, the canon of diplomatic studies. There were no books on the subject. Uh, scholars didn't use the term sports diplomacy. Instead, they referred to the relationship between sport and diplomacy. We had about five or six articles, uh, and the articles were dreadful. They were anecdotal, sporadic, and focused on familiar narratives, such as the ping heard around the world in 1971, uh, or the role sport played in isolating apartheid South Africa. So the scholarship itself was quite poor, very descriptive, there wasn't much analysis going on or deep thinking or navel gazing. Uh, plus, it was badly out of date for the globalised 21st century. The practice of employing sport was also rather poor. Uh, it too was sporadic. Um, it was a parody of international affairs where metaphorical battles were played out in sporting arenas around the world. And it was elite, this is something important to mention, with uh, high profile politicians co opting high profile athletes or sporting events for purposes of national aggrandisement. So the, the theory and practice of sport was uh, rather clumsy, shall we say. Uh, the, the power of sport and diplomacy were marginal, marginalised, underutilised, uh, and uh, underappreciated, and badly researched. So sport, to me, um, could, could and should be a valuable tool for any diplomat. And I mean that from any level. We're all diplomats, that's another story. Um, but from government to local councils to you and I, sport is an extremely powerful uh, tool for overcoming estrangement. Uh, it's a universal language where no words are spoken. And I'm sure you've all got a story of being in some foreign land where sport allowed you to overcome uh, estrangement between you and the other. So sport regularly unites disparate nations and their publics through a, a mutual affection for physical exercise 
competition in games. So just to talk very briefly about the, uh, the, the concept, how we've developed it, and I, I won't, I'll just mention this very quickly. Uh, long story short, about five years ago, uh, I decided to have a go at the relationship between sport and diplomacy. And I, I wanted to try and reinvent the paradigm. There's one main reason uh, diplomacy is also marginalized in theory and practice. So I thought if I could use sport, which everyone loves, we could boost interest in the business of peace. And again, because I've always loved sport, uh, I thought if I can do this for a living, then I'm uh, on to something. Uh, my love of sport is uh, unusual. I come from a country that never actually wins anything, international sport. Uh, but I do have an Australian passport, so go the green and gold. Uh, the journey began in 2011 when I, I researched and wrote and presented a paper at a conference in Berlin, which I'm happy to share with you uh, later on. Um, and that was one of these kind of uh, seminal papers, the evidence research gap defined the term, the things that we academics like to do. Uh, the only bit I want to mention is the, the definition that we come up with for sport and diplomacy. Um, which can be defined as the use of sports people and sporting events to engage, inform, and create a favourable image among foreign publics and organisations to shape their perceptions in a way that's more conducive to the sending government's foreign policy goals. So just to, that was where we started from in 2011. Um, this, makes, this next slide makes me look as if I've got a very big head, but it's not, not entirely true. Um, this is a, the type of work that we've been doing over the past five or six years. Uh, lots of conference panels, lots of speeches. Uh, as I was mentioning, I do feel like a tape recorder at times, flying all over the world speaking about this stuff. Uh, we've done a number of international journal collections. So we can see here there's about 20 uh, scholars participated in here. We got about another 30 through the special issues. Uh, Caitlin and I wrote uh, in the, the second one that you can see highlighted uh, and this, this, the slide behind me. And Caitlin's topic is quite poignant for today. Her paper was entitled <coughs> The Diplomatic Interplay Between the Commonwealth Games Federation and the Commonwealth Games Host City. So in short, um, we've had a huge growth in scholarship. We had one paper in 2011. We've now got about 49 papers. Um, and this year, we'll also write a couple of books on the, the topic. The theory, uh, the practice of sports diplomacy is also growing Many nations are experimenting with sport as a diplomatic tool. Uh, decades of animosity between Turkey and Armenia briefly thawed uh, when the, the disenfranchised nations coupled high-level diplomatic meetings with a Football World Cup qualifier in 2009. Uh, the Indians and Pakistanis practice a form of political brinkmanship. Um, they get close to conflict over Kashmir, Mumbai terrorist attacks, trade disputes, or any number of security dilemmas. And both uh, prime ministers simply agree to have a, a game of cricket between India and Pakistan to defuse tensions. Uh, the US State Department's heavily invested in sport through a flagship program called Sports United. Um, and this was instigated after 9-11. Uh, uh, State Department realized through the traditional means, such as the Voice of, uh, Voice of America radio station, that they weren't reaching uh, many disenfranchised young people across Africa, the Middle East, and Southeast Asia. And Sports United um, is an amazing program. that They do sports envoys, exchange coaches, and many other things. Uh, Iran is one to watch for the future. Uh, the, after the joint plan negotiation uh, worked in Geneva recently, uh, Iran has cashed up. Um, they've recently got $180 billion released in frozen bank accounts. They absolutely love sport. Um, and they're desperate to try and re-engage the world after being in the cold for the past 30 years. Uh, China um, is another really interesting case. Uh, the Chinese, um, building the success of the 2008 Olympics, um, they, they've started to move towards sports diplomacy. They hosted the Athletics World Championship recently. They won the rights to host the 22 Winter Olympics. Um, and this picture you can see is of uh, President Xi Jinping at Croke Park in Ireland, where someone handed him a football. He looked at this thing as if it was the first time he'd ever seen it. And then he declared that he had an undying but hidden love for the round ball game that no one knew about. So as soon as uh, the emperor said that he liked football, uh, 1.3 billion people said, well, I actually quite like football as well. Uh, Xi's really interesting. He changes teams he supports. When Prince William came to visit him, he declared uh, he was an Aston Villa supporter, as Prince William does. Uh, then he appeared at Manchester United recently, and then he also declared he was a fan of Tottenham Hotspur. 
so he's quite an interesting character. He said he wants to do three things uh, to win the, the World Cup, uh, to host the World Cup, and to boost uh, China's uh, participation in the Asian Football Cup. If you want a hot tip, uh, China will host the 2026 World Cup. Uh, I can almost guarantee that. And then finally, in June uh, 2015, uh, the good old Aussies, through the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, became the first country to officially codify every aspect um, of their formidable sporting footprint into a whole of government strategy. And there are many reasons why governments are attracted towards sport diplomacy, uh, for several obvious reasons. So just to talk uh, quickly to wrap things up, I'm running out of time here. The study of sports diplomacy can now be split into four topics. The traditional historical uh, version, this is the elite version that I was referring to at the beginning, is sort of dying out. The networked version 2.0, this is sports diplomacy facilitated by official diplomats working with many different partners. And the DFAT strategy is a very good example of that. And I've got a couple of copies of it here, if anyone would like a, a look at it. Sport as diplomacies, uh, looking at the continuous representation, communication and negotiation between non-state actors that takes place to make international sport possible in the first place. And then there's the dark side of uh, sports diplomacy, which I'm calling sports A diplomacy. Uh, terrorists, for example, are attracted towards sport for the same reason that governments are, there's, is to disseminate, in their case, uh, anti-diplomatic messages from 1972 in the, uh, the Munich terrorist attacks uh, to 2013 in the Boston Marathon bombings, uh, over 172 terrorist-related incidents uh, occurred uh, with, within sport. So this is a really interesting uh, category. Personally, I'm interested in A-diplomacy, uh, mainly to get rid of Seth Blatter uh, from the, uh, the world of sport. What these people do for the game um, is beyond me, other than destroy it. So there are the four categories we're looking at. In short, there remains a lot of work uh, to be done in uh, reifying each of these categories. Each could be studied independently, but Caitlin and I began to think, is there anywhere or anything where all four of these categories coalesce? So we decided that uh, they coalesced in the Commonwealth Games. These uh, mega events, I realize that's a tricky term when thinking about the Commonwealth Games, um, but they captivate the world like no other. 3.9 billion people watch the Athens Olympics. A staggering 1 billion people, or 15% of the global population, tuned in for the 2012 Olympic uh, ceremony. So these are uh, huge, uh, huge events. In a sports diplomacy context, no other uh, tournament uh, brings together uh, such a diverse range of players. Australia is no stranger to the, the mega event itself. You can see some data behind me there. Um, and the Commonwealth Games, we realized that uh, the 2018 Commonwealth Games could serve as a valuable case study, uh, mainly to test, measure, and evaluate sports diplomacy. We've done a lot of theory on it. We need to now see if it works uh, in practice. So, Caitlin, I'll talk to you more about the specifics of this behemoth research project that we're doing. My aim today was very, very simple, uh, was to explain the concept, to show you that researchers are all over the topic, um, his credence uh, is very, very popular, and it's uh, got a bright future. And quite simply, amidst fragmentation, estrangement, sports diplomacy is a positive phenomenon that should be wholeheartedly encouraged. So thanks. Now hand over to Caitlin. Uh, it's always tricky following Stuart. I don't have the great Scottish accent that people love to listen to. I'm really bad at telling jokes, and I have no familial tie to sport. So um, apart from the fact that I have two young boys that love rugby, and we have actually become a rugby loving family as a result. Uh, my job is really to follow on from Stuart and to take the, the larger theory and concept of sport diplomacy and try and place it in some kind of research, research program. Um, and in doing this, I think what Stuart has done by showing you the extent of sports diplomacy scholarship and practice and the growth in that space, particularly in recent years, is a reflection of diplomacy's evolving agenda um, and diplomacy changing to adapt and respond to a more complex world, a world where nations and cities and individuals and sports people 
are hyper-connected and dealing with each other and wielding influence like never before. In fact, there's a new kind of power, a softer kind of power that is becoming increasingly important for diplomacy. It's the power that we find in influence, in relationships and in reputation. And states, nation states, countries like Australia, even though they're still important in, dipl in diplomacy, they're not the only actors that are wielding power today. So sport is, is critically important in this new landscape. Um, it's particularly important to Australia. You know, we talk about sport as the national religion in many ways. In fact, DFAT used to, the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade, used to refer to sport as Australia's national religion on their website. I don't think that's there anymore. Um, interesting. But it is important. It is a way that Australia has positioned itself in the world and particularly within the Commonwealth of Nations. It's been quite an important orientation. Um, in fact, last year there was a, a, a soft power report that was released by a UK consultancy, Portland. And that report actually identified Australia as number sixth in the world in terms of soft power capacity. But it also highlighted some challenges for Australia going forward. One of them being Australia's very small diplomatic footprint when compared to other OECD countries, for example. And um, it, it interestingly, also noted Australia didn't really have the strengths that it thought it did in sport. Now that's partly because of the metrics that they were using, but it's interesting that sport is very much considered in this space and, and perhaps we have to think about it differently. Um, there are problems and there are risks in this idea of sports diplomacy. The first, and Stuart's mentioned a huge number of examples, but by and large sports diplomacy is untested. We haven't really got beneath the skin of it to identify what are the tangible factors that work and don't work and how do we, you know, where's the guidebook on how to use this? Um, the sporting landscape is unwieldy. There is a risk of assuming the role and relevance of sport to diplomacy and in fact what we probably need to do is reconceptualise this space and observe sport a little more closely to identify the factors that facilitate and inhibit diplomacy as a result of sport. And the other thing is that a lot of the studies that are out there that touch on this space, many of them done by you, Stuart, um, offer, you know, offer many, offer lenses to look at, but, but there's no, there really hasn't been a larger multidisciplinary study of sport and diplomacy that um, brings together a whole bunch of themes. So this is the landscape we're presented with and it offers a lot of challenges for scholars. Um, there are two factors though that have been very important for bringing research forward, particularly in the Australian context. The first is the launch of Australia's sports diplomacy strategy and it is a world first. So it's actually something that puts some parameters from a practice perspective around sport as a vehicle for diplomacy. The second is this opportunity that comes with a timely, relevant and proximate case study and that is the Commonwealth Games. So those two initiatives have really given us the opportunity to construct a framework for a, a larger interdisciplinary research program. Um, so whilst we have this framework, I guess there are still some issues and there are certain questions that we have to ask ourselves. How do we draw our analytical boundaries around the study of sports diplomacy, particularly if we're taking an interdisciplinary look at it? Um, how do we critically examine sports, sporting events and sporting people when in fact there are a kaleidoscope of issues, interests, experiences um, and actors that all seem to um, move around the same space but often you know the boundaries of what they're doing are very fuzzy. How do we draw lessons and identify recurrent patterns? So these are some of the the questions that I think we're going to try and answer through um, what we want to do which is an evaluation of the impact, the diplomatic impact of sport through the lens of the Commonwealth Games. So before, during and after the Commonwealth Games. In doing that, we've taken the four pillars of Australia's sports diplomacy strategy. They're here. Firstly, connecting people and institutions. Secondly, enhancing sport for development. 
Thirdly, showcasing Australia and Australia's capabilities and credibility to the world. And fourthly, supporting integrity and, and innovation. In looking at those four pillars that sit within Australia's strategy, we did a, a very quick preliminary analysis and identified sport for development as the spearhead or the key priority theme that we really want to explore through the Com Games and through the various case studies of the Com Games. Um, and the other aspect of the Com Games, what it offers us is an opportunity not just to focus on Australia, the nation state, but actually to draw some multiple perspectives. The perspective of the city as a global actor, the, the Gold Coast in this case. The perspective of the state, Queensland, and I think this will be really interesting because I think our sense at the moment is that the idea of sport and diplomacy is fairly undeveloped in that space. Um, we'll look at Australia, but also we have an opportunity to look at the role of the institution, in this case, the Commonwealth Games Federation. So, um, in terms of our goals for a research program, we want to really highlight sport for development as our thematic priority. We are hoping to incorporate multiple perspectives, and we're looking at doing this by engaging scholars, practitioners, and the community through a research program that is qualitative and quantitative. We will, build, we will be exploring the range of metrics that might sit within um, the theme of sport for development, but also engage in conversation and, and undertake a range of interviews that can flow through that and triangulate our research. What do we want to deliver? We want to be able to deliver a framework for evaluating sports diplomacy through the lens of a major event, something that might actually have relevance for Australia's broader expertise in the sporting space um, and might even be exportable to other nations in terms of their own learnings. Um, we're going to be looking at how we can develop the theory and practice of sports diplomacy um, and we want to engage people. So our big idea is to work with Gold Coast to host an event aligned to the Games that can actually bring scholars, practitioners um, and students of sports diplomacy together. And then lastly, we hope we are in a position to promote and generate a lot of research but also media and, and broader conversations around sports diplomacy. So we're at a, an early stage. We're defining our concept and our scope. We're also looking for interest. So if there are any of you here that think, you know, my research is in the health science space, but perhaps there are some development outcomes that haven't really been considered through the lens of diplomacy, we would love to talk to you. Um, you know, you might be in the legal space as well. So really what we're doing is putting out a call for interest. Um, we're hoping to have conversations with other researchers to look at how we can work together. And then we'll really be hitting the road to design and develop this research program, something that can be interdisciplinary, innovative and inclusive. And um, just on that note, I want to say a big thanks to Lisa and Annette for allowing us to speak today, because this is a great event and it's really fantastic to be part of it. So thank you very much. <laughs>